from the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. This is Rendezvous with History, a podcast that captures the drama of presidential decision-making. Dr. Anthony Eames sits down with prominent scholars and leading citizens to bring to life what happens in the White House and how it shapes the world. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. Welcome, Rendezvous with History listeners. As always, I'm Anthony Eames, and I'm here with H.W. Brands, the Jack S. Blanton Senior Chair in History at the University of Texas, Austin. And we're here to talk about his latest book, Founding Partisans, the uh, Hamilton, Madison, Jefferson, and Adams, and the Brawling Birth of American Politics. H.W., you go by Bill. So, Bill, welcome to the show. Glad to be with you, Anthony. Um, so this book uh, comes out pretty much at, 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 as an important time as ever, although uh, as a historian, as a fellow historian, I think we could always say this book is as timely as ever because things seem so bad or things seem so polemical. Um, but with all that we're hearing coming down from from the courts, uh, with the you know increasing divisions of the uh, and polarization of the political parties, uh, it's almost comforting to read this in a sense to know that this has somewhat always been the case. But what I want to start now is on your end, the genesis of this book, why this book, you know, what's new? Why did you want to put this out here for, for public consumption? I wrote a book a few years ago that was about the American Revolutionary War. And I called the book Our First Civil War because the angle that I was taking is that Americans were more deeply divided among themselves than Americans were divided from the British. The short version of the American Revolution is Americans collectively get cut up with British legislation, so they riot against the Stamp Act, they declare independence, they wage their war, they win, and that's that. Well, in every, as in everything else, uh, things are more complicated. And the complications, to me, have always been the interesting part of history. And the complication there was precisely this division among the Americans. And again, it, it gets lost in the 15 second version of history, but anybody who digs further knows that it's there. So I wanted to know what happened afterwards, because that book ends basically as the British sail away from New York and leave the Americans to themselves. So what happened at that point? So this is pretty much a sequel to that. Well, now I'm 1783, basically to 1801, when Thomas Jefferson gets inaugurated president after a very divisive and contested election. An election, I didn't start the book during the election of 2020, and I wasn't anticipating anything like that. But as I I will say this, I usually write the, the introduction, in this case, the prologue to the book is the last thing that I write. And so I've written the whole book, and then along comes 2020 and the lengthy continuing contestation of the results there. And I thought, well, okay, so so what from that earlier period is akin to what we're seeing now? And it was this question of, we had this election, how do we count the votes? Is the vote legit? What happens if the votes don't get counted the way we thought? Um, there was a president who was tempted to override the results of the election. And so I, uh, at the end of the prologue, I leave the reader hanging. So what's going to happen here? Now, of course, this is something that happened 200 years ago, and most people will know how it turned out. But nonetheless, I did want to, at that point, draw a connection between the two. Um, you're absolutely right that this is, well, so it's, I mean, I, I sort of think it's a timely book. My publisher thinks so because, um, you know, that's is something that we're arguing about right now. Um, but also, we could have been, the book would have been just as timely and about 15 other moments in American history. And so, so the, the difference between something that is timely and timeless is that the timeless things are always timely. So, so that's where we are. Bill, I think you're uh, perfectly qualified to make that statement. It seems you've written a book on just about every period uh, of American history from the revolution to the present day, including one of our favorites here at the Reagan Institute, Ronald Reagan himself. Uh, so I think it's it's best here now to frame the cast of characters you're you're kind of putting in the spotlight. Um, we'll get into the, the kind of details of those debates, what was driving the partisan kind of, uh, you know, politics and intention between the two. But first, let's get a sense of their ambition, their egos, 
uh, and, and really, you know, their philosophies. Um, and, then, and then we'll kind of dive into the rest of the book. I find that I cannot write history except as a subspecies of biography. I have to tell my historical stories through individuals. And in the case of this story, I chose four. And since I'm describing the emerging of political parties, if I have four, I better divide them up two and two, except the two and two sort of shift over time, which is one of the, I think, the charming and reassuring aspects of this story, because I'll, this will spoil the story a little bit, but many of your listeners will already know this, that James Madison essentially flipped sides. He was the arch federalist. He was the one who drove the program to write a new constitution and to get it ratified. But then after it was ratified and after the new government took, took office under this new constitution, he began to wonder what he had created. And from being the close ally with Alexander Hamilton, he became Hamilton's arch foe. And he went over to the side of Thomas Jefferson. So I have four individuals. These are Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams. And Hamilton and Madison really kick off the story because in the last days of the Revolutionary War, which coincide with the first days of the Articles of Confederation, they quickly conclude that the Articles are entirely deficient to managing a nation, to creating a government for a nation. The Articles of Confederation was set up as an alliance of states, with the states sovereign and preeminent. So those two, Hamilton and Madison, they're both young. This is crucial. They're both young, which means they have their political careers ahead of them, which means that ambition is a very large element in what they are doing. This is most noticeable in Hamilton. Everybody who knew Hamilton knew that this was, this was somebody who was going places, and he was in a hurry to get there. He was quite clearly smart. He was articulate. He was gifted in all manner of things. But he rubbed everybody the wrong way. He had sharp elbows that he was always using to, to clamber his way ahead. And this is sort of what you would expect of uh, the immigrant kid come to America trying to make good. Madison was a bit older, a bit more polished in this regard, a bit more pushy, I mean, excuse me, a bit less pushy in his dealings with other people. But nonetheless, no less committed to the idea that the government of the United States needed revamping. And I, I say, and I don't think I push this too far, when I say that these two young guys, Hamilton was in his mid-20s when this, when this debate begins, and uh, Madison was about 30, they really intend nothing less than the overthrow of the government of the United States. Now, that, this sounds like a big deal. And one of the questions that I had, and I put to my students and readers, is, is it a bigger deal to overthrow a government that is five years old or a government that is 200 years old. Now, I think most people would say to overthrow a government that's 200 years old is a bigger deal because it's shown that it's lasted the test of time. But of course, it means, you know, overthrowing government is overthrowing a government. Anyway, so this is what they do. They're going to undermine, uh, do an end around the Articles of Confederation, create a new government. And this is the project they, they put to themselves. At the beginning, so I've got Hamilton, Madison, Jefferson, Jefferson, at least in the early days, is an off-scene, off-stage commentator because he's in Paris as America's ambassador, minister, strictly. But he is in close communications with Madison and the two. Madison's something of a Jefferson protege. And so um, Jefferson gets to comment from off-stage, but he's, he's commenting on the stuff that he's hearing from Madison and from a few other people. And the fourth member of my quartet is John Adams. John Adams is... He's in some ways the most intriguing, the most charming of the, the four individually because he was, well, as Benjamin Franklin said about him, he was on, as honest as the day is long, but sometimes he was absolutely out of his mind because Je Adams was obsessed with the idea that history would not appreciate all the great work that he did on behalf of the country. At one time, he wrote to Benjamin Rush, who was a mutual, mutual friend of all these people, and he said that when the story of our revolution is written, it's going to be a pack of lies from beginning to end. And the gist of the story is that Dr. Franklin struck his lightning rod on the ground and out jumped General Washington. And between the two of them, Franklin and Washington, they conducted all the affairs of war and peace. And then the subtext was, and I, John Adams, who was diligently doing all the important work, am not going to get any credit at all. So ego and ambition clearly from day one, central to American politics, to the sustainability and durability 
uh, of the nation. So you've kind of grouped us into the, uh, the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist camps. But within those camps, of course, as you lay out, there are uh, a whole host of disagreements, a whole host of tension points, and a, a few things that really start to animate the anxieties of the people who either want to keep the Articles of Confederation in place and reformed and amended as such, or to those revolutionaries in, in spirit and in practice who are looking to essentially overthrow the five-year government. Uh, it seems one of those first instances is mutiny. Mutiny at the state level, connected to concerns about taxation, really draws out the anxieties of not only the politicians themselves, but people throughout throughout uh, uh, early the early republic. So um, could you tell us a little bit about those episodes of mutiny and how central they were to Sure. The forging of the American Republic. Yeah, so this is critical. And I'll add here that there's a fifth character who doesn't make my title page, but he is hovering in the background of all this. And this is George Washington. And George Washington is the, is the one that Madison is really trying to get on board behind this effort to remedy, amend, really undermine the Articles of Confederation. And for Washington, this question of mutiny, this question of rebellion is a really big deal because Washington had to deal with mutinies within the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War. And he took stern action and were executed for mutiny. And so Washington was a character, first of all, he stood in stature, head and shoulders above everybody else involved, with the, the exception of Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin is a bit different because he was older by a generation than Washington. It was clear he was ailing and was in his last years. So he was beyond ambition. So, But Washington, Washington was in his 50s at this point, and he had done his service in the military, and he wanted to go home to Mount Vernon. He remembered again that there were times during the war when mutinous soldiers had put pressure on the government and the government had sometimes had to yield. And then, and then he goes back to Mount Vernon. Meanwhile, Madison and Hamilton are concocting this scheme for a, a convention that's going to ostensibly suggest amendments to the Articles of Confederation. They hold a convention in Annapolis, Maryland, in the autumn of 1786. And nobody shows up. I mean, a, just a handful of people show up. So nothing like um, anything that passed for a quorum. And so they quickly pivot and they say, well, this wasn't really the convention. This was just a preliminary convention. The real thing is going to happen in Philadelphia next spring. And at the time they made this change of approach, they had no reason to think that the reception was going to be any better in the spring than it was in the previous fall. But they had to do something. But in the interim, during the six months between the two, something really important happened that had a consequence that was really important. There was another rebellion that broke out in western Massachusetts, the so-called Shays Rebellion, named for Daniel Shays. And these were a bunch of Revolutionary War veterans, farmers, who felt that they had been misused by the government of Massachusetts that had increased taxes on them and they didn't have the money and they were just finagling with things, leaving the farmers basically at the mercy of the government in Boston, the way that American colonists has felt that they were at the mercy of the government in London before the American Revolutionary War. And so the remedy that Shays and his followers, again, these are veterans of the war. They, they had their guns. They knew what to do with them. And they mobilized. And they basically tried to intimidate the government of Massachusetts. And Washington saw this and he said, this is absolutely horrible. We fought this war to win our liberty. And is this what liberty becomes? And so when Washington saw this, he, he wrote to friends, he said, what in the world is our country coming to? We've got to do something about this. And Madison writes another letter, General Washington, we can really use your help in Philadelphia. And Washington says, I'm, I'm on board now. And so when Washington signed on to this pro project to fix the national government, then all of a sudden it had a legitimacy that it didn't have otherwise. And this is a direct consequence of the thing you referred to, the fact that the country seemed to be falling apart or exploding or somehow just dissolving. And 
The argument that Madison made to Washington is an argument you hear again and again in American history. When the politicians want the general, the retired general, to come into politics, they basically say, the victories that you won on the battlefield will be lost in the field of politics unless you step in. And so Washington allowed himself to be persuaded. And this is a trope, of course, that we see over and over again in American history, as you, as you point out, any number of generals becoming president uh, in later years after after fundamental conflicts that challenge American sovereignty and democracy. So now let's fast forward to those days, that summer in Philadelphia in 1787. Uh, Washington is there. They succeeded in getting the ever punctual Washington to show up on time, um, which, of course, as you point out, made him rather uh, grumpy and impatient at the lack of punctuality from uh, other members of the convention. But we see the disagreements start to multiply. Uh, we see the disagreements start to multiply in part because the interpretations of history also seem to multiply. Which periods of history to use, the ancient republics, the more recent past in Europe. So one of those foundational conflicts it appears to be is, one, the size and shape of the republic. And two, the means of representation. Yeah. I want to hear your comments on this. Yeah. So you raised this issue of how do we interpret history and in light of the political history of the present. We, in 2024, are in the middle of another one of the rounds of the history wars. And the thing about the history wars is they're really never driven by history. They're driven by current politics. And people go back into history. They dip into history to find an instance, a moment that supports their present political position. So there's this kind of fishing, cherry picking kind of aspect to all of this. And this was true at the Constitutional Convention. But so the biggest, the biggest philosophical difference among the, the delegates there was how strong they thought the central government should be. Now, I need to point out that Madison and Hamilton put together this, this convention on, on the premise, on the stated premise, that this was to suggest amendments to the Articles of Confederation. And they put it that way because it made it really safe, a really low risk kind of venture for delegates from almost any state. The small states were worried because they knew, first of all, that Madison from Virginia, which was the most populous state, Hamilton from New York, the second most populous state, why would they want to change the existing government? Why, of course, to increase the weight of the larger states in the national government. But the Articles of Confederation said that it could not be amended except by unanimous vote. So Delaware, Rhode Island, the small states, they could say, well, okay, we'll send somebody to Philadelphia and you know, at worst it'll be a waste of our time because they'll suggest something and we won't like it and we'll veto it and nothing is lost. Well, what they didn't realize was that Hamilton and Madison were a couple of steps ahead of them because as soon as they all arrive, they declare a quorum, they close and lock the doors, they swear everybody to secrecy, and they say, you know, this business about amending the articles, we were just kidding about that. We're going to write a new constitution. And so, and in fact, a few people did leave at that point. But the rest, anybody who did come to Philadelphia was at least mildly disposed to think, we need to fix this existing government. There were people who stayed away. Patrick Henry stayed away. He could have been a delegate, but he said he got the invitation, he smelled a rat because he, he thought that more was afoot than was being acknowledged in public, which indeed was quite true. And so, but, but even within that group, there were basically the delegates of the smaller states, I should add, in the Articles of Confederation, every state had an equal vote. So the delegations from each of the states, they got together, but Rhode Island cast a vote, Virginia cast a vote, and each vote counted equally. And for the big states, this just didn't seem right. They were wedded to the the idea of republicanism, where political power emerges from the people, and res publica, the things of the people. It's not, you know, res, things of the states. And so they wanted a government that more accurately represented the people. But of course, this was self-serving. They, they were sincere in this, but it was also self-serving if you were from a big state. So what Madison initially wanted to do was simply change the form of representation and make it entirely by population. So there would be a unicameral legislature, and Virginia would get 10 times as many votes as Delaware, you know, according to the population. And, and that would be that. Actually, in conversation, in, in correspondence with Jefferson, Madison went even further. He, wanted, he really wanted to basically erase 
the states and to leave them perhaps as administrative subunits of the country in the way that counties today are subunits of states. But he understood we're going to have problems if we have these two levels of sovereignty. If the states at some level are still sovereign in some things, and then the federal government purports to be sovereign over that, you can't have divided sovereignty. It's either sovereign or it's not. And of course, we've been debating this one ever since. Madison did not get his way because the delegates of the small states, they said, forget it. You know, we, the situation we have now suits us very well. You know, one state, one vote. And, and they're saying, we joined this move for independence, we joined the war, we joined the Arles Confederation, the understanding that we were represented by states. And a state is a state, whether it's a big state or a small state. And you're asking us to give up something. Well, I don't know. And, and, and in fact, eventually the small states went along with a compromise. And the big states went along with a compromise, which is the Congress that we have now, which has a House of Representatives where representation is by population, and a Senate where representation is equal state per state. And so this is one of the grand compromises at the Constitution, at the, at the convention. And both sides were willing to accept this compromise. The small states figured this is the best we're going to get. And if we walk out, then all that's going to be left at the convention are the big states. And they could create a republic of just the big states. And then where would we be? And so if Virginia allied with New York and throw in Pennsylvania and you know, maybe Massachusetts, then where the smaller states can be, they'd have no choice to go along. So we get at least something out of this. And Madison recognized that if he put out something, if he and Hamilton and the other members of the Constitution Convention put out something that, that left seven, let's say, seven or eight of the states out in the cold, then that would really have legitimacy problems. So a compromise was what they came up with. And their compromise is what we're still living with today. And you do point out these true moments of compromise. In, in the early republic as being key to the kind of durability of the United States as a, as a political entity. You've, if, if you've given us the X axis, that is small states versus the big states as a, as, a, as a major point of disagreement and ultimately compromise, you also give us the Y axis, which is the southern states versus the northern states along, along the issue of slavery and who We're counts as an American. Now, and if I can throw in a Z-axis, then there's also, there's also the question of how much power do you think government in general ought to have? Now that sort I mean, and it's, and so big states versus small states, but there's also the question of states versus the federal government. And this is one that didn't map directly to big states to small states because the big states did not end up dominating the federal government. And so then the question would be, so Jefferson, for example, was an early advocate of state sovereignty, state predominance, and federal government coming second. Um, and he was from the biggest state. And so because of this initial compromise between that gives us the House of Representatives and the Senate. Then there's a second set of compromises. So what are the powers of the states? What are the powers of the federal government? And where does that go? And then on top of all of that, there is, so the third axis is between North and South. And this is one that is, that seems to be a bigger deal in prospect than it is at the moment. Because we're talking about 1787 when this convention takes place. In 1776, by British colonial law, slavery was legal in every one of the 13 colonies. Now, the northern colonies, starting with Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, during the Revolutionary War, ended slavery. They said, okay, we don't have to do this anymore. It was a relatively easy thing for them to do because slavery played very little role in the central operations of the economy. You could just, basically what it meant is, House servants now get paid rather than bought and sold. Okay, so that wasn't a big deal, but it did, it did set up this philosophical divide because before that time, there was, there was no functional or institutional difference on the issue of slavery between North and South. Slavery was legal everywhere, no big deal. But once the states get to chart their own futures, then the Northern states, they decide, we don't need slavery, don't, we don't want slavery. There was a general feeling emerging at this point that, okay, we are living in this republic, and a republic is based on the will of the people, however we're going to interpret this. And that doesn't fit very well with the philosophy that undergirds slavery. And so 
slavery became this moral baggage. And it was a moral baggage in both North and South, but it, was, it wasn't counterbalanced by anything in the North. So the North was able to just chuck the baggage out and okay, we're against slavery. In the Southern states though, Virginia, the Carolinas especially, the economies operated on slavery. They would, all those, all the Southern states would have had to entirely rethink their business model. And in business model, those really meant how could the state survive? And so, however, I should add this, we're in the 1780s and the principal plantation crop to this point is tobacco, rice a little bit in the Carolinas, but tobacco. And tobacco is really hard on soil. So in places like Virginia, they've been growing tobacco for 180 years, 170 years, and, and they were wearing out the soil. And George Washington could see the declines in the tobacco yields were going down and down and down. He started getting out of tobacco into wheat and other crops such as they grow in the north. And Washington, Jefferson, basically everybody, with the exception of a few hardcore South Carolinians, thought that slavery was probably dying of its own weight. Now, within 10 years, slavery would be revived by the invention of the cotton gin and the opening of the old Southwest to cotton culture. And then, then, it, would, then it would become strong. But in 1787, it was relatively easy for the conventioneers in Philadelphia to say, okay, there's no reason to hurry about trying to end slavery. They did agree to end the slave trade, which was the worst, the most brutal aspect of the whole enterprise of slavery. But there was this, there was this feeling, the Virginia certainly thought this, that slavery would die of its own weight. One last thing, and that is this new government of the Constitution, it was much less intrusive on the lives of individuals or much less intrusive reaching beyond the state governments to the, to the people than federal government is today. And so it really did not occur to most of the delegates at Philadelphia that they really had any business telling South Carolina they could no longer have slavery. I and mean, that really was a mask for states. I would add that, for example, it was 100 years before there were federal laws against even such things as murder. No, these were all done at the state level. But again, this is on the supposition that slavery is really on its way out. Monarchy, you got rid of monarchy, we'll get rid of slavery. But it didn't happen that way. And then as things develop in the 19th century, it really becomes this divide. We see the beginning of the sectional divide in Philadelphia. I want to talk a little bit now. We've, we focused on... The convention hall in Philadelphia and those hot summer days uh, and those tense disagreements and the occasional parties at Ben Franklin's house come into your, into your book um, to be a fly on the wall at those occasions, right? Yeah. Um, but this debate isn't just taking place in, in that hall in Philadelphia. You, you bring a lot of attention to Plubius versus Brutus okay. in the press. Yeah. And if you could, one... Who's reading these papers? Who are reading these accounts? Yeah. Right? Who are reading these arguments? Is it the wealthy aristocratic landowning elite? Or is it a bigger population of, you know, soon to be or nascent uh, Americans uh, that is, are consuming these arguments? And how are these arguments taking shape in the public? Okay, so to answer the last part of your question first. The people who were reading these were what I would call the political class. Now, at any given time, there's a political class. Uh, then that sort of begs the question, because how big is the political class? Who's in the political class? I'll get to that. But as long as the convention is going on, there's rumors of what's happening in Philadelphia, but nobody knows for sure. But as soon as they open the doors in September, after they all signed the, the, the Constitution, and Washington sends a cover letter around to all the states, now everybody get behind this and let's ratify it. That's when things burst into the open. And this is when people are talking about, okay, well, what is this new thing? And what's the philosophy behind it? So Hamilton and Madison enlist John Jay, and the three of them, they write what becomes the, the, the greatest, the most important commentary on the Constitution then or ever. And that it's collected as the Federalist Papers. And these are anonymously signed articles. The three of them use the same uh, nom de plume, uh, Publius, and they make the case for the Constitution. But there are other people who are making the case against the Constitution. Now, the, those in favor of the Constitution, they do a good job of branding. They call themselves the Federalists. The ones on the other side, they get caught sort of behind the eight ball, 
and they just come out as the anti-federalists. And it's, and, and this is crucial for my, the story that I'm telling here, which is about the emergence of political parties. On an issue that has a yes or no answer, where you finally ask yay or nay, then it certainly is predictable that you will have two groupings. Those people who are in favor, you know, whatever their other differences are, on this issue, they'll get together, so they'll push together. And those on the other side, they'll get together too. So nobody was surprised that there were these two, we'll call them groupings. They didn't even rise to the level of factions at that point. Faction was a term that was more polite than party. Party was almost a curse word in politics in those days. In the same way, we don't have depression, economic depressions anymore. We simply have recessions. So factions were less dangerous than parties. But nobody really thought that this debate, which had given rise to these two groupings, had created anything permanent in American life. Because we've got this one issue, and it's a one-time issue. You ratify the Constitution or you don't. What they were not counting on was the fact that, well, what drew the people to support the Federalist side, to support the Constitution, was a relative degree of comfort with a stronger government and with a stronger federal government as against the states. So if you liked bigger government, if you liked stronger government in 1787, eight, early 89, this is the period, 18-month period, when the debate over the Constitution is taking place, then you were a Federalist. You were in favor of it. If, on the other hand, you were skeptical of government, skeptical of government in general or and skeptical of central government vis-a-vis -vis state governments. A lot of the opponents of the Constitution thought, well, okay, um, government is this necessary evil, but let's keep it as, less, as little evil as possible. So we'll keep the political power at the state level. Don't give it to this irresponsible central government. So this philosophical difference takes place. And this is what they're arguing about. Now, they argue about the details. They argue about, so the powers of the presidency. They argue about the power of the purse. They argue about this, that, and the other thing. But at heart, it's this fundamental divide. And I would suggest that in any arena of, politi of competitive politics, in the United States, another country, whatever era of history, there is this fundamental divide. Are you comfortable with power, giving power to the government, or are you uncomfortable? And this was the divide then, to a very large degree, it's the divide we're still arguing about today. But there is one interesting difference, and that is that the party that was arguing for more government power, led by Hamilton, and at that point Madison, more government power, more central government power, is the party that has become, over time, embraced by modern American conservatives, who profess to dislike government power, and especially federal government power. So it's a complicated story here, but, but the philosophical difference is there. And lastly, I should say, that it's one of the, the themes of the book, that at first, the framers of the Constitution, the people who had won the Revolutionary War, they thought, or at least they spoke as though they thought, that parties would not emerge in America. And they must not emerge in America because in a republic, our government has to be based on civic virtue. The citizens will be willing to put the interests of the nation ahead of personal interests, which is a nice thought. But it's either delusionary or it simply ignores the fact that people can be utterly sincere in promoting the national interest but have fundamental disagreements over what the national interest consists of. And so they, all of them at the beginning talk, we don't want parties, we don't want parties. But then parties emerge. And parties emerged again because of that similar dynamic. In politics, most questions ultimately come down to a yes or no answer. You support this bill, you reject this bill. You support this amendment, you reject this amendment. That being the case, the default setting for competitive politics is two groupings, whether you call them parties or factions, whatever you call them. And because in, in competitive politics where votes are taking, well, you try to form alliances. You get people to vote with you. And sometimes that means you say, well, okay, I'll support you on this one. You support me on the next one. So if by some chance politics could be the equivalent of a multiple choice test, rather than a true-false test, 
then we might have multiple parties. We might have you know, parties A, B, C, D, and E. But no, we don't, because that's not the way politics usually works. It's true or false, yes or no. So that's, that's how we get to two parties. It's really interesting how you, you first, first of all, we're now entering into the, to the section of the conversation where we dispose of the myths we learned about American history in high school, um, about the, the framers' views of parties and their place in American politics. One of the themes you kind of have present throughout your book is this moment is a rarity in that political theorists are also political practitioners. Yeah. And their theory is constantly revised and driven by the realities of practice. Um, it's a very interesting dialogue you have with those two parts of the book, if I do say so myself. Now, myth two to discard from things we learned in a high school history class, politics stopped at water's edge wow. in the early republic. Yeah. You really do a good job of bringing out this, this relationship between the Federalists and Britain and the Republic, Republicans, the Anti-Federalists, and France. Yeah. Well, so as long as political differences remain domestic, as long as they remain intramural, then they can only become so acrimonious because you don't have to assume bad faith or treason on the part of the others. You can just say, okay, we have a difference of opinion. But once you bring in foreign powers, then foreign powers imply a threat to the nation as a whole. And when foreign powers enter the political debate, it's not simply, do you disagree with me? But are you actually an enemy of America? And it emerges in the 1790s because the two great powers of the day, the ones that were involved in the American Revolutionary War, most centrally, Britain and France go to war. They go to war again. They've been at war forever and ever since 1066. But they're at war again. And because Americans had been and want to keep conducting commerce, trade with both countries, Americans, they, took, they go sailing away across the Atlantic, trying to take their cargoes to Britain, trying to take their cargoes to France. And the French try to cut off the British, the American trade with Britain, and the British try to cut off American trade with France. And that's sort of what you expect during wartime. But Americans stand on their neutral rights. But anyway, the British are trying to, to the extent they can, bring the Americans in on their side. And the French are trying to bring the Americans in on their side. And so this kind of matches up with the different political philosophy, but less, less because of philosophical matters than with the personal matters. So Alexander Hamilton, who has emerged as the head of the Federalist Party, even during the Revolutionary War, was an admirer of things British. And he, in fact, wanted the, the American presidency to be modeled on basically a Republican version of the British monarchy. And it was convenient for him that, well, George III and we got George I, George Washington of America. And so Hamilton, and, and I should add that Hamilton and the Federalist Party were mostly the party of commerce. And people in commerce, they want to do their commerce. And after the Revolutionary War, American commerce reverted to its natural connections to Britain because it had these colonial connections, so they recraft the connections. The leader of the other party, the Jeffersonian Republicans, is Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson just had this philosophical and cultural affinity for France. And so Jefferson thinks that France has the better of the argument against Britain. And so you get these personal preferences of the leaders of the parties mapped onto this war in Britain and then mapped onto American politics from that. And so, I mean, there are moments in American history where, where foreign policy intrudes, where foreign policy intrudes in competitive politics. We see it in the year 2024. And the wars, foreign wars, have deeply divided political parties here. Well, it began in the United States in the 1790s. So Hamilton called Jefferson and all of his party Jacobins for the most radical element of the French Revolution and basically said or implied that if the Jeffersonians get elected, they're going to bring the guillotine to America and heads are going to be rolling in the streets of New York and everywhere else. And the Jefferson's Republicans called uh, Je uh, Hamilton's Federalists, they called them Anglo men, Englishmen, and monocrats. So they were going to bring back a monarchy. And and precisely because there is this where you can call your enemies, your opponents, not simply wrong, but 
treasonous, traitors. This really gives a sharp edge to what this is all about. And it culminates, at least at this particular moment, in uh, some of the most egregious laws in American history undercutting freedom of speech. Now, this, these are the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798, which is um, a very ham-handed attempt by the Federalist Administration, the Federalist Congress, to silence opposition. And the philosophical basis, or at least the rationale, for the sedition, the Alien Sedition Acts, is they're allowing French agents to undermine American security. So we've hit so many different points of disagreement and the political courage of these brawling partisans does stand out when you point out there's revolutionary violence ongoing in Europe, there's mutinies and rebellions that, that end in bloodshed in the early Republic. And of course they had just overcome or had just won um, the revolutionary war in contest with, with the British empire. There's one other kind of, kind of point in this book, or actually there's a bunch of other points in this book. They were all neatly in that, that conversation and debate about the centrality of government, of federal government, but it's the, the agrarian versus the urban, the banking class, the merchant class versus the, the gentleman farmer, if you will. And it's tied into all these different issue sets that you've brought out, specifically the relationship to British credit uh, and to French politics. But if you could kind of put a fine point on that divide in these constitutional debates, that would be good. And then we'll wrap up with a question that I ask everyone about uh, what is the next frontier for researchers and, and historians and, and what was the, the most uh, revelatory archive or primary source that you used in, in your work? Sure. So the, the rural, urban, rural urban split, the cities against the farmers, it's one that originates at this point at a time when the great majority of Americans live on farms, make their living through farming or, or something close to the land. It also was what, in the, certainly in the minds of Jefferson and his followers, distinguished America from Europe. So they're always asking themselves, what's different about America? Because they like to think that we're special, that this is the beginning of American exceptionalism, this idea that we're different. Because, and they had to be different because they looked at the history of Europe. They said, oh my gosh, but the history of Europe is history of war after war after war and corruption after corruption after corruption. And we don't want that to come to us. Now, they had, a, they had made a good start because they had this republic instead of a monarchy. So that was good. But, but of course, Rome had had a republic for hundreds of years and that declined into monarchy and empire. And they didn't want that to happen. So what is going to preserve America? And what's going to preserve America is the independence of farmers. And they looked in Europe and they saw, well, the farming class got more and more oppressed as the cities grew and as the population grew, the, the size of farms shrank and shrank and shrank. But in America, this needn't happen because in America, there is endless land, sort of needless to say, the existence, the, the presence of the Native American peoples wasn't part of this conversation. There is an assumption we can always get more land. And so Jefferson really idealized the, the yeoman farmer because, and the thing about the independent farmer was because this person was an entrepreneur, because this person supported himself and his family, he was not dependent on anybody else. His vote, his political affiliation could not be purchased. And so it had to be won by argumentation. So Jefferson was able to, to make this argument. And even some of Hamilton's followers, they felt obliged at least to pay lip service and kind of a tip of the hat to that, because it did sort of get at this idea of what made America different. But even then, even then cities were sort of overrepresented in government because this is where the merchants were, this is where the money was. One of the big debates in the early years of the new national government was, is there gonna be a central bank of the United States? And there was primarily because Hamilton really organized his supporters and came up with this persuasive argument, created this central bank. Well, this is when there were hardly any banks at all. And now there's this bank that has the imprimatur of the federal government. And those rebels under Daniel Shays, they were rebelling against the financial clout of Boston just within Massachusetts. And now they look around and they see, oh my gosh, this is 
recurring. This is re being recapitulated on a national scale. So we see this split between the country and the city. Of course, it's going to get only worse as time goes on, but it's going to be a theme through the 1890s when the populist movement complains about the rise of the cities. In many respects, it's a complaint today where Remember, people from small states from the heartland, and they call them the heartland. You know, we are the heart of America. And those, that crazy left coast and the crazy east coast, it's the people in the middle that really matter. We're the ones who are the true Americans. In a place like America, where you rest political power on the people, everybody's trying to lay claim to being the true America. It's also, it's also and this, isn't, this is not accidental, that the farms are where immigrants are less likely to land. And when they, if they do get there, they're less obvious. So cities are where the immigrants go. Americans have been fighting over this question of who let these people in? And why are they not assimilating? Why, are not, why don't they look more like us? Why don't they believe like us? Why don't they do all this stuff from, the, from before American independence? So in writing this book, I just was reminded that the issues we're debating today have these really long roots. And you can I mean, as I sometimes say, well, this is bad news and good news. The bad news is that if you don't like partisanship, and most people profess not to like partisanship, then so the bad news is it's not going away. It's been with us for 200 years, so it'd be foolish to think that it's going to disappear tomorrow. The good news is in all that time, it hasn't killed us, so it probably won't kill us yet. We might have another 200 years. Well, that's a, a really comforting kind of note to you know end the book on. Uh, hopefully, we'll have um, our listeners take some inspiration from that from that moment of insight. Now, what I want to do is wrap with this, um, Bill. You've you've written a number of books. You've directed a number of students over the years. Uh, what archive? What primary source was most valuable to you in writing this book? Okay. And, and what more needs to be done in this area? So, the timing uh, for me writing this book. I was writing this book during COVID. And COVID, of course, shut down most of the archives. It shut down everything else. But because of the foresight of the National Archives and Records Administration, then headed by David Ferriero, there was this big move to put all the papers of all the founders online. And they all came online about 2015, 2016. And this has made all the difference in the world in doing research. Because it means even if you're stuck at home, even if the National Archives, the Library of Congress, you know, all the other libraries are closed, you can have access to this material. So this is a fantastic boon to anybody doing research. And you ask sort of where are the frontiers of research? Well, it's related to this, that by making this stuff available to people who don't have research budgets, who can't take six weeks and go live in Washington four blocks from the Library of Congress so they can spend all the time there. This opens up the study of history to everybody. And so I'll be, I'm a historian. I will be the first to admit that history is not rocket science, that anybody who is reasonably intelligent, diligent, who can read and who, can, who has the, know, the instinct of a journalist, I want to know the answer to this question. Here's this question. I want to find out the answer. Now, a bright high school senior can do work that is comparable in certain respects to what professional historians can do, because it's all there. When I teach my students, I say, okay, it's nice to know what the historians have said about it, but as quickly as you can, go see what the, the participants, what the eyewitness groups are saying. Go to what the historians call primary sources. And now primary sources, more than ever, are available to everyone. And so I think we're going to see a blossoming, if not an explosion, of research in sort of all directions from all across, all across the table, because the, the sources are available in a way that they never were before. Well, I look forward to that moment when everyone is their own historian. Uh, Bill, thank you very much for coming on the show again. This has been a wonderful recap of your new book. Again, Founding Partisans, you can get it on uh, anywhere, get it on Amazon or anywhere you find your uh, books. Thanks again, Bill. Good to talk to you, Anthony. Rendezvous with History is a podcast produced by the Ronald Reagan Institute Scholarly Initiatives. You can learn more at ronaldreaganinstitute.org and follow along on social media at Reagan Institute.